Future trends, deep insights, industry leaders. This is the iGaming Next podcast with your host, Michael Peterson. This podcast is brought to you by Pragmatic Solutions, the leading iGaming PAM platform with a modular approach, including many benefits like a fast, secure, and scalable API-based platform integrated with all major third-party products and services. Make sure you head over to Pragmatic Solutions and join our smart thinking. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are listening to this iGaming Next podcast. Uh, today, we are diving deep into the marketing and, and brand world, uh, and that's what we're covering in, in this section. Uh, and I am super thrilled to have none other than Mr. Martin Bradley from MTM with me today. Martin, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm in a wet and cold London, but apart from that, I'm all good. Yeah, London does tend to be... Uh, well, wet at least, cold in the in the winter as well. I I stayed. I lived there for two years. It was pretty wet for two years most of the time. It's not quite the climate of Malta, hey. <laughs> well, that we we uh, we um, we shout about three hundred days of sunshine in in Malta, uh, which is fairly fairly accurate, I would say. That's pr- pretty good. Uh, but now we're in uh, we're twenty third November today, and it's um, it's it's very rainy outside, and it's been so for the last week. So we're on we're on London. Uh, London, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, temperatures uh, and weather forecast at the moment, unfortunately. I've, I've probably had 300 days of sunshine in, in 39 years of London. <laughs> <laughs> London London can make a reverse brag of uh, 300 days of rain every year, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good. Martin, uh, I'm super excited because today we are going to talk about... Um, well, the headline for this section is uh, ABC of Customer Insights. Uh, and this is a topic near and dear to my heart. And I think uh, as the iGaming industry overall, I think it's an area that we could do uh, significantly better in. Um, and I think we, we have to take uh, a step change uh, to, to do significantly better uh, over the coming years if we want to sort of keep up. So I'm super happy to be, uh, be here with you, Martin, and to, to, to discuss this. Um, but before we do that, could you give us a brief intro to uh, MTM and, and also to, to yourself, Martin, and, and your career journey? Yeah, sure. And thanks a lot for having us, Michael. Super excited, too, to talk about insights in the iGaming industry. But yeah, so I'm Martin Bradley. I'm a director at MTM, which is a research and insights consultancy which specializes and works only in the tech and entertainment industry. So there's about 55 of us based in London, We've got an office in Leeds, also in the UK. Um, and yeah, we work with big tech brands of the world. We work with you know, telecoms, we work with broadcasters and streaming in video gaming. And then one of the big areas of our business is iGaming. So we've got a dedicated iGaming team who work with some of the biggest operators in the world. We also work with smaller operators. We work with the likes of you know, Flutter, we work with the likes of Betway, ATA, Bragg, those types of companies, uh, you know, helping them with what we're going to talk about today, their consumer insights. And it's, uh, it's an industry that I've worked in for about 12 years of my now 15 years in research. So I've you know, seen quite a, a change in the industry in those 12 years um, and also a, a change in how they approach insights. But as you say, we're still not quite there when it comes to some of those other industries that I've worked with in that time. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that. So if we... If we have to start out with like a health check of the iGaming industry in terms of sort of just overall, in terms of uh, how we are doing from zero to 10, 10 being fantastic superstar customer insights researchers, uh, what score should we give ourselves, do you think? Oh, what a question to start with, eh? <laughs> I think if I compare you go it first. to... You go first, I'll, I'll give my verdict <laughs> as well. I think if we compare it to other... 
uh, similar industries. There's no direct comparison, but I do a lot of work in video gaming mm -hmm. and also online content. I think compared to those industries and the maturity of insight in iGaming operators and providers, and I'm kind of filling by the number forms in my head, <laughs> I reckon I'd say rather six. You know, it's, six. Not, it's not it's not disastrous, but there's 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 a way to go. Okay, and if we then take video game industry, where would you put them? They're sort of a, a ten or a nine or an eight, or where would you? Put yeah, them? they're probably a nine. Nine in comparison. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. So we have some work to do. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I, I'm, I, th I probably think six is a is a bit generous. I, I'm probably gonna go five. I think uh, it's a it's a rough split down the middle. Uh, I think uh, I think there are some operators and and companies out there that are uh, really good, really advanced. Uh, tend to be the larger companies with with more uh, financial muscle and uh, and uh, and a bigger team. Um, but that's also something we're going to cover today. That you don't have to be a, a flutter or a kindred or or whatever it is to to engage in in this. Cool, but let's start with uh, what is customer insights, Martin? How would you, what's the definition for anyone who might not have worked with the area before? Like, how do you define this? Sure, and I mean, hopefully I get this answer <laughs> succinct and right. <laughs> I've been doing it for 15 years. Yeah. Uh, but the, I mean, the simplest way to see customer insights is it's, it's a process or an interpretation used by businesses uh, to get a deeper understanding of a particular audience and how that audience thinks and how it feels to kind of analyze that human behavior to really understand what their co consumers, their players, whatever it may be, customers want. But most importantly, and I'm sure we'll come on to this, like the kind of what Insight adds is, is why. It's the why behind players act or consumers act in a certain way. If we kind of break that down a bit more, that, that could be, you know, your, your own customers, it could be understanding your competitor customers. It could be understanding the wider market and how the wider market thinks and behaves and acts. It can also be internal stakeholders in your organization and speaking to them and understanding how they feel about where the company's going. Mm. Um, it can also be uh, customers in, in a B2B sense. So if you're a B2B a company, you can speak to your customers and understand how they feel about the product or the service that you're offering them. That's probably the, the headline. You know, it, it's a way of collecting data, and that data can be in various forms, and transforming it into a narrative, a story, insight as such that answers a specific problem or issue that your company's having. Mm -hmm. And then if we, we kind of take that a bit further, uh, there's different types of customer insight, um, and sometimes it's broken down. I try not to get too technical now, but it's mm. broken down into, into primary and secondary insight. And primary insight is, is insight that you collect, that we collect by talking to people um, or sending them surveys or having focus groups and those kind of things. And secondary research is working with already published data, so you're like industry, trade data, and using that, again, as a way to kind of uh, interrogate that data and form a narrative mm. for the problem or the issue that mm. you have. Mm. Okay. We can then go a little bit further. I'm sure there's there's a few terms that people will have heard. Again, not to get too technical, but there's there's qualitative and quantitative consumer insights. Qualitative, a lot of people heard about kind of focus groups. You know, you get a bunch of people in a room and you talk about things, you show them products, and you try and try and get them to brainstorm maybe something new or get, get their biscuits, reaction. biscuits, coffee, all these things. You do. You get free food <laughs> free and if you're lucky enough to be a. a <laughs> <laughs> Lucky enough to be a client sitting in the back room. You sometimes yeah. get a glass of wine as well. It's a, it's a nice evening out. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's focus groups. There's kind of more like uh, intimate one-on-one -on -one interviews that you can do. Um, and then quantitative is, is things like people would have heard of like surveys, you know, sending out mm -hmm. surveys to people, online mm -hmm. surveys, mm -hmm. and getting their feedback on, on a range of questions and issues. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to try and make this kind of specific to eye gaming. Uh, we can try and bring it out to like what, what's consumer insight in the iGaming world. And it is really varied. You know, it could be something very small in terms of bringing an outsider view to your business. And that would be just by getting a company to talk to your stakeholders and then trying to just collate that information and playing it back to the business. Mm. It can be something very specific in terms of understanding or improving the user experience of your product. So in terms of trying to 
understand the customer journey between registration and first bet and trying to remove those pain points. That would mm -hmm. be a specific consumer insight problem to address. Mm -hmm. Could be about understanding a new market that you're moving into. You know, you don't really know much about that new market. So you would go and, and speak to, to players in that market to try and understand their needs, their behaviors, their attitudes. Or it could be something huge, you know, like tracking multiple brands in multiple markets. So mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's a wide range of things that consumer insight can be, but it's ultimately collecting information mm -hmm. that helps you solve a particular problem or issue. And that issue can be something very small and specific, or it could be your future strategy for five mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. V very good. That was, that was, that was excellent. So I guess to dumb it down and, and simplify it even, even further, I guess it's sort of no matter what you're trying to improve, I guess, or whether it's your uh, market strategy, where do we go next, uh, uh, whether it's your uh, product, uh, how do we improve, you know, where, you know, how, what should we offer next, how can we improve our existing products, or it's marketing or advertising related, whatever it may be, it might be a good idea to start by understanding the end consumer that's going to be experiencing uh, this um, this product or, or campaign or, or whatever it might be, right? 100%. And it's... So, it's yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, it's it's also good to, to kind of talk about how it, it doesn't exist in isolation. I think that that's where yeah. a lot of people see market research. Is it, it's just something that you do in isolation on yeah. its own. And it's not. You use it for all the other data or information or knowledge that exists in your business yeah. to help solve that problem or make that marketing campaign better. So it's, it's, it just shouldn't be seen as a separate thing that mm -hmm. you just do and then you feed it back and then you make some changes based on that. It's all mm -hmm. about using all the information at your disposal and Insight is a supplementary way for mm -hmm. all the great stuff that exists in mm -hmm. your business. Mm -hmm. Very good. I remember reading once, I think it was uh, when Toyota wanted to launch the, the Toyota Yaris um, uh, brand into the US. Um, the first thing they did was sort of appoint who is going to be leading this, this effort in, in the US. Um, and they did. And then the first thing they did was they, they sent him to live in the US, I think for was it a year or t even two years? It was something like that, an extended long period of time. Uh, before even starting the the, the, the whole sort of uh, uh, design product line, whatever, you, as in just it just to, goes to show how much effort they put into understanding the end consumer and the market and the ecosystem and the landscape that the end consumer lives within. Um, before you 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 even start putting components together to to form a product, so to speak. Yeah. So um, and yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great example of a, of a company who see insight as essential to, to making something or yeah. improving something. As you say, it's every service or product is, at the end of the day, used by an end user, a customer, a player, whatever that product is. And only really can you make that product as optimal as possible by understanding how they behave, what they mm. want, and mm. their attitudes and needs. Exactly. So although we sort of indirectly covered uh, sort of why is this important to some 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 extent, I, th I do think there is a let's let's call it a new a new paradigm, a new era in iGaming that we're uh, we probably have been you know going into over the last couple of years, but but you know we're getting more mature as an industry and uh, the, the world is opening up more and more every month. Uh, you know, the US, uh, Latin America, Africa, I mean, the, literally the entire, the entire globe is um, considering uh, or, 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 or opening up for, for, for online gaming uh, just to, to more or less extent. Um, and that also means that we were speaking about in our prep call that there are also, uh, how can I say, now is probably the time to pull up our socks if we haven't already already done so. Why is it that you think that, Martin? I mean, there's a number of reasons. I think you know, one of the main ones, as you kind of alluded to, is there's a lot of new entrants coming into the market. And this is something that, that kind of came up a bit in, in iGaming Next recently in, mm -hmm. in Valletta. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's, it's a new kind of world for the iGaming industry. You have the zone bet coming in. You have fanatics who are coming in, and mm -hmm. then there's obviously the rumored Disney and ESPN 
bed in breath mm-hmm. however that is going to exist but mm-hmm. it's, it seems to be on the cards yeah and those kind of brands are coming at it from a very different angle they are entertainment brands whether that's like tv or film or with fanatics you know it's about wider sports and, and consumers and, and fandom mm. and they have a completely different starting point and understanding of what consumers want when it comes to entertainment products mm. and their lives outside of bedding. And I think that's, that's a really important um, kind of point in the industry is that we sometimes see iGaming as, as sitting on its own in isolation. And we don't think about the wider world that consumers live in. iGaming is one of their forms of entertainment that they do in a day. And mm. The rest of their time might be spent on video gaming. It might mm. be spent on TV. It might be spent going to museums, mm. whatever it may be. And those types of companies we've talked about understand that landscape more and that dynamic mm. in a way that the more traditional brands in iGaming haven't. And they mm. obviously have a lot of data on wider entertainment habits. And it's just it's it is a challenge, I think, to the industry that there are these. Big, you know, big brands, their own fanatics, potential ESPN coming in, disturbing the industry, and it is it is a challenging time for some of those more traditional operators, as we said, in terms of how they they compete mm. against these brands. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's just the start, right? These three. I mean, I'm sure. I mean. I don't know. At least when we when when I meet people, everyone is talking. I wonder when Amazon <laughs> is gonna do uh, an online gambling brand. I mean, uh, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, all were sort of uh, one foot into the, the the business, if you will, via via Twitch um, uh, platform and the, and the slot streaming and, and and video gaming space. And and when will that come? So so overall, I guess what we're saying is there are there are brands out there and the companies out there that are that are you know native to the entertainment industry. Uh, is living media entertainment and and understand the sort of like the consumer more in depth the ones that score nine on your scale in the beginning <laughs> uh, that are now rolling out the the eye gaming um, uh, strategy right or or is likely to do so in in, in the near future uh, and therefore um, let's say the, the 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 I guess it would be fair to say that the the better you understand your consumer the better you understand the day to day that they live within the higher the chance is that you can be relevant and as a brand uh, and as a product. Exactly. And and, and the, the, the three companies that we've talked about, and there's obviously, as you said, there's who knows if Apple, Amazon, someone big's going to come in yeah. that, that we haven't mentioned. Yeah. Um, Apple Arcade will have... go uh, real money gaming. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it first. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, they're also coming in with with your know, media brands that they own to reach consumers as well in yeah. a different ways. So it's not just their understanding of mm. the market, which is hugely important. It's yeah. they're able to reach players. Yeah. The reach in is, is insane. Right. I mean, and they, they own these pipelines of, of, of reach or, or advertising uh, avenues, if, if you will. So they're, they're quite a beast. You don't want to, <laughs> you don't want, you don't want to come unprepared to that, to that match, so to speak, to that fight. Yeah, and it's you know who knows if 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 the zone you know have a boxing match on, they're in charge of the advertising and and the revenue that goes around that that match. They you know they they could just promote the zone bet, yeah. um, and have you know official odds and yeah. stuff like that. So it's a different dynamic when it comes to big events. Yeah, and you know, you know Disney and ESPN, you know they they own the media rights to yeah. certain sporting events. So yeah. it's it's a completely different ball game. Yeah. That, your flutters are entertained or you know, even smaller operators are, are competing against. Mm. And we talk about knowing the entertainment space because that's that re- I mean, in the eyes of the consumer, that's where gambling sits, right? It's part of their entertainment uh, wallet every month, so to speak. Um, and, uh, but, and, and, uh, you know, having been in industry for, for 15 years soon, it's, uh, it's, you know, the buzzword, we are entertainment brand and we are moving into the entertainment space and, and, uh, recreational play. And, you know, we don't want, uh, VIPs and, and, and all these kind of things that we distance ourselves from it. So there's a lot of, um, talk about wanting to become an entertainment destination. Um, in, in, in your view, Martin, are, are we, are we managing to also be an entertainment destination or are we on the way to that or are we still doing gambling so to speak and, and pitching gambling and, and, and everything gambling 
I mean, I think if we, if we put it back to your one or zero to 10 scale of where iGaming is in positioning yeah. themselves as entertainment brands and understanding that world, yeah. we're probably at, you know, at a four, maybe a five yeah. on that scale there. Yeah. And I think you know, it, it's being talked about more. Mm. You know, big, big nod to your CEO, Chris, who was talking recently about you know, live spins is you know, entertainment is the competition and yeah. we need to be seen as entertainment brands. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously you know, better than me, but a lot of what you guys are doing is around bringing a you know, community to, to iGaming, mm-hmm. something that hasn't always existed in mm-hmm. the iGaming world because that is what a lot of other entertainment products offer consumers. It's not just the core product that they go and they buy or they use or they watch. It's the wider engagement that that product service mm-hmm. can offer and having a community. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what the wider entertainment world has done for years. You know, if you think about sports, they've always tried to go beyond the core product and engage their fans, whether that's activations mm-hmm. or, or, or trying to sell the merchandise. It's all about trying to become more salient yeah. in those consumers' minds. Yeah. You think of kind of video gaming, you have huge communities that exist for whatever title that you're interested in. You know, mm. Discord chats, Reddit threads, huge communities where you can go and talk about the product, but you're not actually engaging with the core product at the time. Mm. And that's what different sectors within entertainment have managed to do in a way that I don't think iGaming has quite got there. Mm. It's also about you know, new forms of monetization. Yeah, the, the core money for any I gaming provider is always going to come from, you know, the revenue that they get from mm. from people. Yeah, betting on sports from from the spins, uh, from yeah. the hands, all that mm. kind of stuff. But we need to think about how, as a as I gaming operators, we can branch into entertainment and get new forms of monetization, whether that's merchandise, uh, whether it's kind of activations, just becoming more engaged mm. in a player's life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, get, I mean, your comparison to, to video games, I, I, I get it, but I guess it, it would be fair to say that video games is, is much more of a skill uh, skill game uh, or skill-based game, right, in, in, in the vast majority of times. And maybe it's, let's say, it's e- you know easier to build community around that or it's something that you want. There's an, there's an organic sort of um, pull towards these kind of communities because it's a way for you as a player to improve your skills or learn from others or or just hang out with other people who are like-minded. Uh, so I agree, there's a lot of things we can learn from it, but uh, I actually still... You know, we were just in in Vegas uh, a month ago for for G2E, uh, and I actually still think there is so much we can learn from that city and and that, that the land based space where, uh, I, I, you know, rumor has it that they, they say the, the internal mantra is "Don't sell gambling, never sell gambling." Right? I mean, what, what you go out and advertise is the brand, it's the experience, it's the entertainment, it's the wrapper around gambling that that sort of is the. The, the the attraction to 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 pull people in and then gambling is you know you have to you can't go in and out of the hotel without without <laughs> passing the slot machine or the roulette table right so but that's that's an indirect uh, sell right so so i guess at least when i look at at vegas i think there is so much the online brands can still learn and figure out and and we as an industry need to figure out like what is cirque du soleil the o show at bellagio what is the equivalent in an online space uh, what is the equivalent of the Tao nightclub or beach club or whatever it is? How do we do that in online space? How do we build? Uh, uh, um, uh, how, how do we become much better at brand and creating some sort of emotional connection to 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 a brand? Uh, because whether we, you know, no matter how we twist and turn it, the the, the product, you know, sure there is differences, but it's it's not, you know. Uh, you know, if you go to ten different uh, online gambling sites, it's not going to differ that much. It's not like it's going to be night and night and day, right? So what is left? It's the brand, it's the it's the experience, it's the entertainment part, and it feels like as an industry, we're still um, we're still we're still learning. What what is that? Like I said, what is Cirque du Soleil <laughs> in an online uh, in an online space? Maybe we should hire them and stream it uh, in the <laughs> casino lobby, uh, Martin. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting thought. Sign up and see see the O show. Uh. <laughs> but it's, I mean, you can kind of learn from the video gaming world in terms of, you know, you think of like Fortnite and these mm. huge artists like Travis Scott mm-hmm. and Ariana Grande having concerts in Fortnite. And it's, yeah. it's about giving people a reason to go somewhere yeah. 
Um, to create but why can we not have a concert inside the casino lobby? We should do. sign let's, up let's, and get the front row it up. to uh, <laughs> exactly. Let's do it, Martin. Uh, Hopefully, it doesn't end up like Fire Festival. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But um, I, I think there's also another point along this around. It's connected to to what we're talking about about understanding the world of entertainment. And, and you're right that that gambling operators sometimes focus too much on selling gambling, mm. and we don't think about connecting with players in their outside world. Mm. Like, Yeah, an obvious and big example is is Red Bull, mm. you know, and how they've taken the brand mm. into sports and just you know through advertising and partnering with you know, snowboarding, yeah, the the kind of earliest things that they did, and then they they decided that's the type of consumer that they want mm -hmm. to to connect with, mm -hmm. and having their brand around these cool events then creates a perception of that yeah. brand, and that's they want to be seen as kind of out there and extreme and cool, and, and that works for them. But there's mm -hmm. there's Certainly certain partnerships, I think, the iGaming world needs to look to to create that sense of brand, mm. exactly as you're saying. It, mm. it's, most products are the same. You know, you go on, you, you put some money in, you, you pick an accumulator, you put, play, some, play some slots, you play some hands, whatever it is, it, it's, mm. it's a fairly similar product. So mm. what's the difference? The mm. difference is that feeling about that brand. Oh, mm -hmm. I bet with Paddy Power. They're mm -hmm. really funny. They make me laugh. I follow them mm -hmm. on Twitter. They give mm -hmm. me a reason to engage with them. Yeah, and that's you know that that's an example of a brand that at least is trying to stand for something, mm -hmm. and that filters through everything they do. Mm -hmm. and it's not for everyone, but for the people who 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 like it, it's engaging and gives them a reason. Yeah, I think uh, Red Bull is probably the closest example I can think of. Uh, so it's almost like the. The Las Vegas of energy drinks, if you will, <laughs> to some extent. Yeah. So they, like you're saying, they managed to build the, the 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 brand and the 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 entertainment factor to a large extent. Actually, as in, it's a, it's a content play. It's a it's a it's a universe. It's a world that uh, attracts consumers and retain consumers. And then the energy energy drink itself is almost a byproduct of that, or if, if you know what I mean, a sort of the the, the indirect sell there. Um, yeah, I'm sure if you ask you know a lot of people now what they think about when they think of Red Bull, mm. it, I'm sure a lot of people would talk about the the extreme sports. Yeah. Yeah, the the guy jumping out of the, the balloon yes. however many miles ab above the world and wouldn't yes. even mention the drink. The drink is kind of like you said, it's it's yeah. It's just something that sits around the brand now. The brand yeah. is just this extremely cool, edgy, um, extreme brand mm -hmm. that stands for something you know, very, very uh, salient in mm -hmm. minds. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, um, so more to do on the entertainment front as well. You're scoring us a, a, a four out of ten on entertainment, Martin, <laughs> <laughs> and and a six out of ten on on working with customer insights. So it's, it's, yeah. we we have work to do. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, there's definitely the I think there's definitely the desire in the industry to to be seen as entertainment. Yeah, but I you know it's hard to think of big examples of operators or providers. Yeah. that you can connect with with standing for something different other, mm -hmm. other than gambling. And mm -hmm. Like I said, like the, the stuff that you guys are doing is obviously more about community. There's, there's some great examples of you know, online casinos who make you trying to make their lobbies more interesting and it's mm -hmm. a place to hang out, but mm -hmm. that's still within the gambling ecosystem. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's hardly any examples uh, beyond some huge ones, you know, sponsorship of people like PokerStars and F1 mm -hmm. who are trying to move into entertainment as mm -hmm. such. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, work to work to do. I wanted to touch as well on um, another sort of uh, common, um, what do you call it? Uh, you know, rumor on the street or or motto in our industry, which is that, uh, and it's very relevant to the times where we're, we're going through. So our macro environment around us is 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 a mess, right? So infl inflation, war, recession. Uh, I mean. Uh, Pick pick a pick a pick something negative, and it's probably you know FTX. You know the list goes on. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, but uh, the motto is that, that gambling is recession proof as an industry, um, and uh, and that's obviously something the the investor world is leaning very much into, uh, and uh, we benefit from. But uh, so, as someone sitting with. Uh, research and customer insight and very close to sort of the end consumers on, on a daily basis like uh, is that is that um, 
is that a safe uh, safe path to to travel as the game industry just sort of um, uh, assuming that this might even be positive for the industry when when the rest of the world is is in a negative sentiment um, people will still sort of seek out uh, uh, gambling and and other uh, such industries what, what, what do you think uh, i think that, you know, the, the short answer is yeah the short answer to the question is gambling recession proof is that would be a very uh brave way to operate your company right now i mm. think would be the easiest way to look at it yeah we were talking earlier weren't we about yeah before we came on about we've used the word unprecedented times so mm. much in the last however many years it just seems yeah. there's a there's another crisis um and we've just come through a pandemic where there's a huge impact on the industry you know mm. no land based betting for a long time in, mm. in in a lot of markets and consumer behavior changed and a mm. lot of that went online and stayed online so we've really been through quite a dynamic shift in the industry mm. but in terms of it is gambling recession proof you know if we think about those macroeconomic factors that you mentioned and especially in some of the big european markets i mean the uk where i am especially we're in a mm pretty shit time for for the average person mm. you know and large amounts of people are having to make the decision of when to heat their home mm. and, and how much is their heating bill going to be and, and can they afford to to have heating mm. and i think this period seems different to other other times we've been through mm. and to, to sit back and think that gambling is recession proof and when bad times hit players don't change their behavior and like you said some people think it could even be positive for the industry mm. i think we are in a different time now and we've got a lot of clients coming to us in the wider entertainment world who want to look at the cost of living crisis as they mm -hmm. call it mm -hmm. and the potential impact and yeah there's no proven model right now because we haven't lived through it but you can see quite clearly from that insight that consumers are thinking of cutting back mm. You know, gambling is not the first thing they're going to cut back on because for a lot of players, it, it's, a, mm. it's a small amount of money every week and every month, and it's something that really adds <clears> to their <throat> enjoyment. Yeah. But it's definitely something that will be impacted mm -hmm. for a huge number of players across different markets. Mm. And I think we, we do need to understand as an industry, you know, which markets is it going to hit? the most how is it going to change behavior mm. um and how as an industry can we can we kind of battle against this because i'm not a economist so i'm not making my big mm. prediction for the for the world economy but mm. yeah who knows how long this is going to go on for this isn't mm. a blip this is something that we could be living with for months if not years mm -hmm. yeah yeah exactly uh, and i guess um Maybe there could also be a, a consideration, just thinking out loud here, a little bit like um, the pandemic we went through, where um, there is also a consideration to be a, a responsible brand. Uh, so when people are literally uh, sitting and choosing, shall we have heat in our in our home for our family this month <laughs> or not, um, is probably uh, there's probably a consideration to be had if that's the right time to uh, do a. Uh, five thousand, uh, uh, you know, deposit bonus and and a very very aggressive um, uh, promotional effort uh, when when the world is in in such state. Depending on the market you operate in, of course. Um, yeah, okay. and it's yeah. I was just going to add, yeah, the, the the other reason why we shouldn't rest on our laurels, as you say, and we need to put our socks up as as an industry, is that other brands in the tech world and the entertainment world are looking at this mm. and they are coming up with strategies to make sure that their product is lower on the list when it comes to their consumers having to make a choice of whether they subscribe to Netflix or subscribe to PlayStation Plus mm. that month. You know, this is going on quite widely in the entertainment world. So mm -hmm. we, we should make sure that we're on top of it mm. uh, and don't just say, yeah, gambling's recession proof. It, it's, yeah. it's not. How, can, can you elaborate a bit more on that, Martin? Like, how do they... How do they work with getting lower on the list of things that consumers will will switch off effectively uh, during this period of time? Like, is it is it pricing? Is it lowering pricing? Is it giving more favorable uh, so, sort of terms and conditions or like uh, any examples you can share? Yeah, that, the main one is obviously pricing is a a core uh, part of the process when when companies are thinking about how to retain their customers. But the number one uh factor that it comes down to is content 
and understanding what their players, their customers want when it comes to their content and ensuring that they can serve and provide the right content, whether mm. that's video content, it's gaming content, it's mm. gambling content. Mm -hmm. That's ultimately why someone chooses a product or service is not. So a lot of those, those, those companies are just getting a bit of understanding of how can we create, promote, curate the right types of content that makes mm. my product invaluable mm. and the last one to be turned off. And mm. that is a hundred percent relevant to the gambling industry. It, mm -hmm. it is content that, that mm -hmm. people consume. It just happens to be a different type of content than Disney produce or yeah. Amazon or Netflix or whoever it is. Yeah. Okay. Good. Cool. Um, so, uh, I'm uh, moving into uh, the next uh, chapter in our podcast here, uh, which uh, you know I am personally extremely excited about. Uh, I don't know if, if you are equally as excited, Martin, <laughs> but we sort of agreed uh, that I was going to take on the role of um, uh, an iGaming operator or, or, or provider or you know any any company really in iGaming, uh, sort of. Um, uh, interested in, in insight, but they have a number of pushbacks. So I have the top five pushbacks uh, that you guys probably hear all the time from from the industry, uh, and I would love to hear how you respond to to each of them if you're if you're up for it. Are you ready? I am. Um, I did agree to this. I'm not sure if I'm regretting <laughs> I'm regretting it now, but we'll find out in ten minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. All right, cool. So uh, pushback number one. Uh, you know, Martin, I, I love this uh, customer insight stuff and MTM looks great, but it just simply, I just think uh, customer insights cost too much and we just simply don't have the budget at the moment. That's a tough budget question, eh? I mean, th th there's a couple, there's a couple of you know, easy answers here in terms of, you know, people have a preconception of what insight is and, and it can be expensive. And it can be expensive. Uh, it can also be relatively cheap and and insightful i mean that the main way to look at it in terms of when you're you're deciding i've got this amount of money for my product and my media campaign what's left for insight is we think about what insight is designed to do it's designed to increase your understanding of players increase your understanding of a market improve a product improve a marketing campaign improve your ability to sell to your b2b end users it's all about making something better basically for someone um, in terms of what you're developing or selling. As we talked about at the beginning, if you understand the end user better, you will make that product, that campaign, that service better. Mm. So the ROI, by speaking to players, customers, whatever it might be, will increase if you can include some form of market research. And like I said, it doesn't have to be huge. You know, you can start at 10,000 euros to do a, a piece of research. That can go up massively depending on what you want to do, but it, it's not the most expensive part yeah. of, of your kind of strategy plan. Yeah. Is that the starting line, Martin? Sort of if, if, uh, if an operator wanted to, to, you know, start doing the basics, you know, taking the first steps, sort of a, an investment of 10,000 euros will do something? Yeah, it's it's that's probably the lowest project that we've worked on in the last yeah. you know, couple of years or whatever, and that, that is right at the low end. But yeah. it, it's not. Yeah, you know, the average pro project that we work on is in the tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can mm -hmm. go up to hundreds of thousands and mm -hmm. even more. But mm -hmm. the yeah, ten thousand will, will get you something. Yeah, and it, and it will be useful and it will help you change your business. And it's not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm no, saying this is someone who, who wants who wants um, some work, <laughs> someone leading insight work. But yeah, yeah but it, I, I, it's a small amount of money. You know, I was just thinking that. Uh, yeah, sure, uh, they can they can sign up check of, of, of ten thousand euros. But I think uh, apart from that, I think just the fact that you actually have an investment into research, no matter how small, you're still creating a project out of it internally. When you're creating a project out of it internally. There is yourself or a small team or, or, or a larger team that has to stop, uh, think a little bit, you know, actually pull time out of their calendar to sort of be part of that process. Uh, so uh, how can I say? It's almost like the the client themselves kind of get twice their money's worth because the, of the internal sort of mental um, work that automatically will trigger and start happening by committing even a small amount of money to, to a project, right? So, so I think there is there is a lot uh, uh, it, by just reserving the time internally that you can do internally as well to 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 uh, to learn. 
cool. Pushback number one. Pushback number two, Martin. This is going to take uh, way too long. We just simply don't have the time to wait for you to go out and do all these surveys and focus groups and fancy stuff uh, that, uh, that you take. So we're just going to jump into it. We don't have time for research. I think this is the easiest one to smash. We can we can do this one quite <laughs> quite easily. Okay. There's a couple of things on this for sure. It's it's as we're talking. It, this is all about getting operators to think about insight in a different way. Mm-hmm. And insight should be planned in your in your budget and your strategy for the year. Mm. So if you're thinking about 2023 right now, and most operators and providers will probably have. But insight should be factored in in the mm-hmm. same way that you're factoring in your R and D roadmap in the same mm. way you're factoring in your media plan mm-hmm. like insight should be part of that mm-hmm. so then you can schedule it in mm-hmm. now obviously that's not always the way and something comes up and that that doesn't always happen but that that's the number one to start thinking about insight in your yearly planning or your future strategy planning whatever it is the other thing is is yes it can take a long time you know, there are some projects that we work on that are, that are ongoing and, mm. but they provide continuous feedback there are mm. some projects that, that do take months you know that's that that's there's no point lying there, mm-hmm. but there's also some extremely smart and clever innovations in the industry that let you get insight in 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And that is across qual and quant so that you can, you can, you can test messages or mm-hmm. product innovation with these kind of standardized solutions that you plug in mm-hmm. and you'll have something in 24 to 48 hours. The same with, with online surveys, you can get feedback from, a thousand people in 24 to 48 hours, which isn't a long time. So I think it's as we get more operators and providers understanding what insight is and and the innovations that exist in the industry, Mm -hmm. there's some great solutions out there that that Mm. kind of too long um, shouldn't really be an issue. Nice. So we're down to 10,000 euros in 24 hours, Martin. It's, it's, we're, getting, we're making it more accessible already. I can feel it. Uh, so in my head, I was just thinking, uh, I was just, uh, thinking uh, to what you said, that it, you know, you know, someone asking this question is obviously sort of dipping in and out of, of research, and, and there might be very valid, valid reasons and situations as to why that is the case. But um, it, it really and truly, it should be an always-on kind of investment, shouldn't it? It should always be, uh, uh, you know, allocate five percent or ten percent or whatever the number is of the annual marketing budget um, to 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 do this, to to uh, to understand this, uh, to have uh, have uh, uh, the information and the insights the, for whatever you're going to do in the upcoming year, whether be that market entry, product improvements, or marketing advertising. Right? Uh, to paraphrase my. Uh, my old marketing professor, Mr. Mark Ritson. I don't know if you have uh, <laughs> gone through uh, his uh, his programs and courses, but uh, he he makes such a, a, a massive point on this. Like step number one in anything you do is diagnosis and and sort of market orientation, if you will. Um, and you cannot move on to step number two, which is strategy, without understanding point number two. Uh, uh, and and so there can be no strategy without diagnosis uh, and understanding of the market. Uh, and then as step number three is obviously sort of the tactical stuff and the execution and the marketing campaigns and the PPC buys and what have you, and vice versa. There cannot be no tactics before you have the strategy in place. So there's that sort of A, B, C or one, two, three, and uh, and I really, I really think he's he's spot on with that. And uh, you know, no matter how big the amount is you need to allocate a part of your marketing budget or a part of your uh, overall budget, if it's product development or whatever it is, for, for insights and, and sort of, as opposed to dipping in and out, uh, uh, you know, when you think you need it, then it's probably too late. Exactly. You said 5 to 10%. Let's make it 20%. Uh, 20%. Keep, Ooh. keep everyone at MTM happy. I was, try- <laughs> I was trying to make, make this, uh, continue to make this accessible, uh, Martin. But, uh, all right. Okay, pushback number three. Uh, usually paraphrased from uh, from uh, good old Steve Jobs as well. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But I hear it a lot in the gaming industry as well. No, but players don't know what they want. Like, so there's no point in asking them. We have to. We know better internally, and we have very smart people hired, and we need to surprise and delight with something they have never thought they wanted. Yeah, and it's as you said, Steve Jobs. No one seems to quite know if if he said it or not. And there's also you know the famous Henry Ford quote about if he had asked uh, people back whenever it was what they wanted, they would have said faster horses yes. because no one knew what a car was. Yes. And yeah, this criticism you know, is valid at certain times. You know, if you're talking 
about a new concept or a new product that's that's very hard to articulate or is completely new, like a car. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a very obvious example. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's easy to to understand that consumers would struggle to mm-hmm. understand is that product useful to their life. So it's all about what you're trying to do with insight and mm-hmm. the easy link to make with eye gaming. Um, where this criticism would fit in, which kind of make it uh, accessible to people and understand is, is something around the metaverse, which again is something that's been talked a lot about in the industry and where the metaverse fits in. This criticism would definitely fit. You know, most consumers don't understand the metaverse. Mm. I do a lot of work in video gaming and they're obviously looking at the metaverse uh, and are leading the metaverse mm. Mm. in many ways and have done some insight amongst consumers, but it, it's such a high level conceptual uh, thing yeah. that it is hard to research with consumers and just normal people because mm. they don't quite grasp what you're trying to understand. Mm. So I think there are times when the criticism is true, um, but I think for a lot of things we you know we can't underestimate our players and how much they understand about iGaming. You know, so if you're looking um, to iterate your product, to bring in a new kind of product or enter a new market, mm. that there's there's no way that you know, players can't articulate and give you something insightful that's going to help you adapt that strategy, adapt that service, or adapt the, the product that you're looking at. And it's also, it's also working with a good agency, like MTM. I'll get that in so I can get another plug in. <laughs> <laughs> I had to try. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there's, you, know, you need to work like with all, all aspects of your business with, with good agencies who can advise you on on when maybe that research isn't quite right for the stage and maybe we should wait six months until the product's at a different stage and then we're going to be able to provide you with better insight Mm. so that criticism does hang true for certain things but i think for 90 percent 80 percent of the issues that i've been uh that operators or providers have come to me with there's definitely a role that players can articulate and talk about what they want and will give you something insightful to, mm. to, to kind of change the way your business is going. Yeah. And I think also the type of innovation we as an industry often engage in is sort of very sort of incremental innovation, if you will. It's, 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 a, it's a few few steps to the side or, or, or forward or whatever it is. It's very rare that it's the big moonshot kind of innovation that that we we engage in right it's funny because as an industry we, we're in gambling but we don't really gamble very much ourselves with with our own sort of r&d budgets and and strategies so to speak so so yeah i would say like you're saying there is still a ton of stuff that you can that you can learn from from uh, players or consumers in the market and also like you said before you can like as a brand you can only talk to the the clients that are already with you but how do you how do you talk to the clients that are today with the competitors or 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 is has not engaged with the category yet and that's where where insights can help out as well cool um all right pushback number four uh, martin two left hope you have a bit more energy left here uh, <laughs> so uh more and more especially operators on the b2c side is uh, i i call it the reverse funnel uh, method so they uh, i guess the typical saying would be no we're not going to invest and engage in sort of uh, understanding consumers and top of funnel awareness, uh, familiarity, etc., etc. We're going to start from the bottom of the the good old fashioned um, uh, marketing funnel, and and by that they typically mean uh, performance marketing. Uh, so they would um, um, start a, a, a PPC campaign or or you know w- whatever it might be uh, in a new market or in five new markets uh, and see which market gets the most traction, and then they will sort of take steps up the ladder of the of, of the funnel if you will uh, and become more and more sort of um uh, insights driven and and, uh, and and move from performance into into brand etc cetera, etc cetera. um so so what are your thoughts on that one this is my absolute favorite one because <laughs> this, this is the one you get quite a lot and it's the one i like to to challenge the most but it you know it's it starts with the, you know, where the iGaming industry is at. And we'll, we'll come back to this. Is that It's a very short-term industry. And if you start in the reverse funnel that you're talking about, you know, the kind of PPC, performance marketing kind of way, 
that is very short term because it's just focused on you know, acquiring new customers is, is, is kind of what it's focused on. It, it's not really about, like you say, brand building. Mm. And that's great. You know, you can increase your share. You can get some, some more betters into them. But you're not understanding anything about how to turn those betters into long-term betters mm. with, your com- with your company. Mm. I think that that's one of the things that that really does. It is too short term. Mm-hmm. The other thing that starting that way doesn't tell you, and, and you mentioned it before, is it doesn't tell you anything about why things are working. You just understand which campaign or which particular execution or which offer mm. is working, but you don't understand why. Mm. And actually, then you don't understand how to make that better. Just because one campaign or execution or offer is working, mm-hmm. that could be better. But mm-hmm. you don't know if it can be. It mm-hmm. is, is that the most, are you making the best use of your assets? Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, that is what, you know, really we like to challenge is that only by understanding the wider market um, can you move from this kind of short-term acquisition that is a problem in the industry mm. to longer-term brand building. Because it's a very good example that, that, that I've worked with, uh, I can't say the operator, but for a number of years, and they wanted to increase the kind of long-term lifespan of their customers mm. and also the average value that each customer adds to them. Mm-hmm. And we worked with them and they did a wider kind of branding and, and kind of uh, comms campaign. But for us, it was looking, uh, looking about actually not chasing share and focusing on the type of customer that they were attracting. Mm. So instead of just going out with these kind of performance marketing campaigns and saying, great, we acquired 2% more customers this quarter. We actually worked with them and their share decreased, but their v- revenue went up mm. because they were acquiring the right type of customer for them. That yeah. wasn't going to be a one-time only depositor and mm-hmm. then move off to someone else. They mm-hmm. were acquiring people who wanted to be with them long-term yeah. and were engaged with the brand. Exactly. So good old uh, quality over quantity kind of approach. Um, yeah, and, and thinking longer than just the acquisition, what does that player that you got into the PPC net, uh, how, what happens the week after, the month after, the quarter after? Are they still there? Does it make sense? And, and thinking, thinking more long term. Okay. 100%. So you don't recommend that strategy starting, starting from the bottom up then? Yeah. And it's, you know, we're not saying the same with, with all kind of insight that we've been talking about. It's, it's to be used in conjunction. So I'm not yeah. saying performance marketing. Performance marketing works. You yeah. Know, it's, it, it has a very simple ROI measure. Yeah. So it's about using the two together and with whatever else that you have, you know, your assets in the business to judge campaigns or judge um, certain activations that you're doing in the market. It's, it's using it all together rather than either yeah. or. Yeah. Good. Last but not least, Martin, of the top five pushbacks to, uh, to custom insights. Um, uh, so we're not going to engage with customer insights because it's uh, so difficult to measure success and we don't know if this is, uh, if this is working or not. We left the, uh, the hardest one to last, hey? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, this is, uh, this is probably the, the hardest pushback we get. You know, I think the other four, we can, we can, we can justify why mm. insight is valuable and what it adds. With this one, it, it is tricky. And, and this isn't just eye gaming. This is this is the wider entertainment world in in kind of how do we yeah, measure success? How do we attribute something that we've researched into what it means to our bottom line? Mm. Yeah, there, there's a lot of examples that, that that we've kind of worked on. A lot of it is around setting KPIs, and that can be something like simple in terms of uh, kind of higher funnel, kind of things like awareness, or then lower down the funnel to things like consideration and just you know tracking or, or looking at moments in time mm. based on whatever you've done in the market, how that measure has moved, mm-hmm. and that that will give us you know a KPI measure, just like you have KPIs in performance marketing mm-hmm. that, that you're trying to reach, and we mm-hmm. can we can set targets based on what we know you're going to do to judge whether. The, the product, the service, the campaign, whatever it may be, mm. was a success. The holy grail and the one that, you know, that let's be honest, there's, there's never a, a concrete answer of how to get there because it's different for each company is, as we say, the holy grail. It, it's about linking uplifts to that bottom line. Mm-hmm. So if we were going to run a campaign and we had done some research and we'd chosen the best execution and great, we're going to go out in the market and, 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 and have it on air, and have it out there 
and we want a 4% uplift in consideration in Belgium, mm. it's going to lead to X percent increase in customers. Mm. Um, that, that, that is the, the hardest bit, but there, there is ways to do it, and, and we have done it before. And, and, and how we do it is working closely with operators and using different data sources. Mm. You know, it's using the internal data that operators have. And the mm. great thing about iGaming is operators collect so much information mm. from their players. Just, you know, you think about the number of interactions that mm-hmm. the average player has mm-hmm. and the data fields that that kind of um, constructs. I've yeah. seen some of the data files that we work with, they're huge. But there is clever ways of us using the internal data that operators and providers collect and some of the financial information to connect the two. Mm. Mm. It's never perfect, you know, let's be honest, because there's so much more going on in the world. You can't just attribute something to a change in a product or a new campaign or a new way of talking about the brand, Mm. but we can try and isolate the impact as Mm -hmm. much as possible. Mm -hmm. Cool. So in a a sense... Um, obviously, subject to data being available and 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 uh, and uh, these things, uh, you could say uh, or come out with something where you say, okay, we, if a one percent lift in brand awareness would, you know, in this segment of players that we're trying to reach, uh, would equal roughly this on in terms of new customers, which again then would equal this uplift on the bottom line, effectively. So there is there is a, a mechanic, there is a way of linking. You know the the very top level. This is obviously in the marketing sphere now, in terms of brand awareness and and the activities you do to grow that, and how to link that to the bottom line financially. So the C- so the CFO is happy. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. I mean, th- this is the one that when we talked earlier about the time that this does take time because you need to observe trends and, yeah. and do the necessary kind of statistical analysis to make sure that it's all working. Yeah. Uh, and this is on the more expensive side of stuff we're talking about. You could, yeah, yeah. Please don't, please don't come to me and ask for this in 24 hours. 10K, 10, 10K, 10K, 24 hours. <laughs> I want to know 0.3% increase in brand awareness. What, what, uh, how much money did I make? No, we, we get that. All right, cool. Martin, thank you so much for the top five pushbacks. I think you, um, I mean, if we go back to the scoring, I would, I would give you a nine out of 10 here, Martin. That was pretty good. Uh, pretty good um, pushbacks. Uh, came out relatively unscathed. Yeah, yeah, that was <laughs> good that was good okay so moving on to our very last uh, part of this uh, this podcast uh, which i'm very excited about as well which is sort of more like you you promise to sort of uh, bring with you a, a couple of case studies just to make it even more tangible for for the listeners at home um whether you're an operator or or or, or business so um uh, so we look at sort of a small operator case study and 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 also a big operator uh, case study with all the the fancy stuff and the bells and whistles, so to speak. Uh, but let's start with the with the small operator, uh, Martin. Is there anything uh, uh, you can share there uh, in, in terms of a, a hands-on experience here? Yeah, yeah sure. And yet the 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 ten k that I gave you, we obviously you teed me up before before yeah. we've recorded in terms of something we've we've actually done, and, and that is something we've actually done quite recently. The yeah. study was around around ten thousand. Uh, 10,000 euros and, and that was a, a B2B provider and, and it was pure desk research so mm-hmm. we didn't uh, for that kind of money you, you, you are going to struggle to to speak to a lot of consumers you mm-hmm. could probably do a small amount of, of kind of qual for that mm-hmm. money but this particular study was a, a desk research piece mm-hmm. and was looking at their iGaming platform um, and looking at their content division mm-hmm. and doing a competitor review so whilst everyone in that company understands them very well and they have a good grasp of the competitors, what they were lacking was that outsider view to bring it all together and kind of an unbiased view of the industry and where their strategy to go could mm-hmm. go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, we, we did a, a competitor review of, of 12 of their main competitors. We spoke to a load of people internally. Mm-hmm. And, and the real benefit of that is you know, we're, we're we can get sometimes information that doesn't come out of a business. You know, we all like to think our businesses are free and open and everyone can give ideas. But by bringing in someone to facilitate kind of more intimate conversations mm. and talk to people where that feedback is going to be anonymous and kind of aggregated into mm. themes, you do kind of get a more honest opinion of where the company's at and where it's going. And that's what we did. We spoke to a bunch of people internally. We did a ton of desk research looking at these different competitors that they had. And came up with our our recommendations 
of where the opportunities in those iGaming platform and content divisions, where those opportunities are, what their competition is and isn't doing, and how that can feed into their strategy. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what that, that kind of budget could get you. It's mm-hmm. about us helping you with your strategy mm-hmm. by bringing in a different opinion mm-hmm. um, and facilitating conversations that sometimes can't happen in, in certain businesses just because of the nature of, of how businesses operate. Nice. Very good. And just out of curiosity, and I appreciate I'm putting you on the spot here, but if I was, if I was not a B2B, uh, I was an actual operator wanting to understand players and sort of maybe get outside of the desk research and into, into the more uh, sort of real, real customer feedback or potential customer feedback. What sort of budget start line are we, are we looking at roughly? Is there any sort of guidance you can give on that, Martin? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's on, on the kind of qualitative side, um, I'm, I'm a quant researcher. So if I'm going to get shot down after this by my qual, my qual friends, uh, there's a kind of rule of thumb in terms of, if we think about focus groups, which a lot of people have probably used before, or at least know a lot about, you know, you've got six or eight people yeah. uh, traditionally in a room. That's obviously moved a lot to online nowadays because mm. of the pandemic and hasn't moved back. There's a kind of rule of thumb that per group, so per kind of six or eight people, to talk for an hour and a half, two hours is, is around kind of six to 7,000 euros. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and then that obviously gets you a, a, a part of the report and stuff. So if you were an operator, you know, let's take a sports book operator and you were looking at your registration journey and you wanted to speak to a group of your customers, a group of your competitors to feel how they found about registration journeys at, at different operators or, mm. or getting them to, to take your registration journey and find pain points. Mm. You could get something, you know, up to twenty thousand euros mm. would get you kind of two, maybe three groups, mm. uh, different types of, of of players, and understand the differences and how you can improve that journey. Cool. Thanks for that. Good. And uh, then let's move into big operations, <laughs> uh, big big brands, and uh, and maybe. Uh, uh, show us where the where the ceiling is, Martin, for for MTM. If money is not an issue, and uh, and you know we have the friendliest CFO in the world, then <laughs> then then what can we do? And maybe uh, and, and like I said, if you have a, a case study or a practical example, uh, that would be great. Sure. I mean, hopefully, there's um, big CFOs listening. <laughs> can chuck some, some yes. big money. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean that. The, the kind of numbers here can get quite high, but if we take the, you know, a, a Flutter or Entain of the world who have dozens of, of different brands that operate in dozens of different markets, the, the kind of big operator case study that, that these um, or some of these brands are, are doing is these kind of big brand trackers or creative and communication trackers that will operate in dozens of markets and will cover all their brands that operates in their markets and will speak to thousands of players across the year, like you're saying, this kind of continuous feedback. Mm. Those types of companies will have these, these kind of big trackers in place. They're, they're continuous, they're in multiple markets, um, looking at all their different brands on offer. And, 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 when, and when, we say, them, when we say brand trackers, Martin, just in case someone uh, is not so familiar, what, what, what does that mean and how does it work? Sure. So it, it's a it's a way of understanding um, perceptions. So that that can be high level funnel things like awareness, familiarity, and consideration of your brand and also your competitors in the market. And it will also go into kind of strengths and weaknesses. It will go into what people associate your your brand with um, and how it stacks up to the competition. So a lot of a lot of the big kind of tier one operators will have these brand trackers to kind of monitor their brands in each market, how they're mm. performing over time, and then mm. to try and identify competition um, that's kind of creeping up on them or, or where they need to improve some of their kind of branding or mm. campaigns. On, 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 so, so if I was in 20 markets, I would have a brand tracker in each market or in my key markets, whatever it is, that go out every month or every quarter or whatever the, the frequency they want literally finding a rep- representative sample asking them you know these questions to get these perceptions and you can track uh, at one point in time or you can also track over time if you're trending up or down and uh, and and where the where the party is heading so to speak 100% mm. i should have gone with that answer <laughs> no no you did great <laughs> 
uh, very good. And uh, and uh, is that the ceiling? Is that the the bells and whistles? Is that the the fanciest of the fancy? Or is there is there a next level stuff uh, as well? Yeah, I mean, there's there's kind of there is fancy stuff. So that so that kind of example is the the high end of of the money where you're talking six figures, you know, at least six figures and, mm. and more, you know, mm. hundreds of thousands in, mm-hmm. in in some instances, but just because of the amount of work that's going on. Yeah. But then there, there is some fancier stuff that that sits more in between the numbers that we're talking that is really you know innovative and helps operators with their strategy. Mm. So there's 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 studies that we've done recently um, in terms of segmentation. So the easiest way to to put this is most operators, and hopefully hopefully most people working in the industry will know that most operators have their own internal kind of clustering, whether Mm. that's B2B or B2C. On a a B2C side, a lot of operators have clustering of their players Mm -hmm. on their data platform. Mm -hmm. And obviously a lot of the B2B providers also provide through their managed services or their PAM some form of um, clustering of Mm. players. So Mm. you can identify this is a... VIP poker player, so mm-hmm. I should talk mm-hmm. to him or serve him this kind of material. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What we've been doing recently uh, with a couple of operators is taking that to the next level because that's great, but it only tells you what your players are doing on your site. You've got no idea what they're doing with other operators. Mm. So what we've been doing is working with all that great data that is held and where we've been past that data and augmenting it with wider behavior. So we can look at a particular player and understand that for um, Betway, uh, for example, that they're doing this. For Betway, they're a high-value sportsbook player. Mm. And there's no casino activity or no poker activity. So for Betway, they would just see them as um, see them as as that type of player and wouldn't serve them anything else. Mm. By augmenting it with other insight, you can then understand. Hold on, we see this player as playing this vertical. But actually, in the wider world, they're, they're also playing another vertical. Mm. And they're doing it a lot. Mm. And you're kind of missing out on the action. And that's what that kind of program yeah. will identify. It helps you cross-sell in a more efficient way yeah. by understanding outside your business what your players are doing. And that, okay. that's a you know, quite a smart, you know, statistical, you know, more expensive mm. kind of option than the, the low end that we're talking about but yeah. it, it sits in the middle of, of what we've been talking about and, and just gives you a better sense of what your players are doing mm-hmm. so if i understand that correctly so if you are zoomed in and you only see your own brand or your own you know this player on my site they might look like a, 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 a very good i don't know live casino player uh, but you guys can help that operator zoom out. And although he looks like a very good like casino player, he's actually his sports betting activity outside in 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 the the rest of the world is actually 10x higher than what he spends with you on live casino. So maybe there is definitely a cross sell or or a way to uh, communicate with that player that you would have no idea about if you didn't have this insight, so to speak. Yeah, hundred percent. And then the other easy way that it that it kind of works and and is useful to what will help people understand is for for most operators, they obviously have a huge chunk of one time only betters or one time mm-hmm. only depositors mm-hmm. that at some point get written off and, and yeah. aren't served any communications. And, and yeah. it helps you identify sections of them who are doing a lot in the market. Mm. You know, they may have just put one bet on the World Cup, but actually yeah. they're, they're, they're betting with someone else regularly on mm-hmm. tennis and golf or whatever. And mm. that's what it will identify. So you can re engage mm. those lost players as such and mm-hmm. try and bring them back in or at least understand what it was about your product that wasn't meeting their needs yeah okay uh and also i've i've heard some some cool stuff as well uh from from my my past where <laughs> it's also possible to as a brand to i mean again a six digit uh, sort of setup of course but uh, where you will literally have sort of uh real time consumer panels almost that you can dip in and dip out of and ask questions and query basically almost in almost in real time so you know if you had uh, whatever your top three markets that are you know significant to your business you could have these panels and you know anyone whether it's marketing or product or whoever it is um, could submit a, a question or a series of questions to to that panel um, and they would be uh, more or less immediately available uh, to you to respond that answer uh, so you get real almost sort of real time 
real end consumer research on demand basically that's uh that's that's pretty intense as well pretty cool i think uh, as a brand but uh, yeah six six digits if not seven <laughs> yeah yeah they're, they're, they're expensive but it's yeah you know, it, it's great for for certain operators if you've got you know bigger operators if you've got multiple brands and in, yeah in a market and that kind of instant access kind of yeah. online community kind of yeah. side is what what it's sometimes called yeah they're, cool. they're, Good stuff, good stuff. Martin, uh, we've come to the end of this podcast. Uh, I think uh, I, I want to just summarize this and, and really and truly the, the main purpose of, of doing this part is to, you know, it's called ABC of Customer Insight. So it is really to, uh, 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 you know, make a shout out to, to, the, to the industry. Uh, do, uh, do engage with this, do understand, do allocate a percentage of your, your budget, no matter how small or, or big that may be. Uh, to understand this, uh, this this end consumer, these markets, this market orientation that uh, that, in my humble opinion, you definitely need before you can build a strategy, um, and you need a strategy before you can do PPC. Very important. Um, uh, so so yeah, hopefully this has been insightful. Uh, we got it down to ten thousand euros in twenty four hours. Uh, it's probably <laughs> the 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 starting line, and then you can uh, you can add on top of that as much as you want. But uh, Martin. Uh, it's been tremendously insightful uh, for for me as well, and I hope it has been for you guys at uh, at home as well. Uh, any final concluding uh, words, Martin, from you? Uh, no, ju- just you know, a couple of short ones around. Your know, insight doesn't have to be scary, doesn't have to be expensive, doesn't have to take a long time. But what it can do is just give you maybe just one piece of information at times that can really change the product, the service, the campaign that you're building or iterating. Uh, that just gives you a better chance of success in the market. So, you know, consider it. You know, it, it has a place to play at, at many times in in the iGaming ecosystem, um, and yeah, can can really transform a business. Very good. Thanks, Martin. If anyone wants to get hold of you or MTM, what is the what is the best way to to reach you? <laughs> uh, once more, might as well just give out my email live live on a podcast. But yeah, <laughs> go, go uh, you for can it. Me Why yeah. not? <laughs> Uh, martin.bradley at wearemtm.com let's do that one one more time martin shall we just uh, just for to make sure it's there say it again uh, martin.bradley at wearemtm.com very good very good <laughs> We did, we did the selling part as well here, Martin. That was not the intention. <laughs> well, hopefully, we added some value as well. That was the point. Cool. Martin, thank you so much for your time. I wish you a, a great uh, and continuous gray and rainy day in London. And uh, can't wait to catch up with you again. Thanks for having me, Michael. Been awesome. Cheers. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.